So one of the most important institutions in our lives, particularly in our early lives, but also in our later lives, are families. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in many societies, the definition of what a family is is very obvious to the people in that society. Um, and yet families sort of vary in what they look like. Uh, in some societies, there's the vision of a family, which is parents and children. Um, but in other societies, families may integrate um, uh, grandparents, for example, in a household. And um, uh, there may be many different um, uh, uh, sets of families that make up one big family. Um, so an entire group of the children and their children of sort of one couple may all live in a home together. And so this sort of opens up the question of what families are and the work that they do in um, uh, society. And by the work that they do, I mean the work of socialization, the work of, and so the work of socialization, meaning the work of introducing people to what society is and what its rules are, but also the work of care and um, the work of help and the work of sort of picking up often where markets or states leave off. Um, and so markets and states do not provide all of the provisions of a society. They don't provide us with everything that we need. And families are a critical place where many of the needs that are satisfied, not through buying them on the open market or by a government providing them for us, come from families. There's also ideas of chosen family or how some of us who may not have strong relationships with our um, biological families construct familial units of our own. Um, and so today we're going to think and actually in, in a series of lectures about what families are um, and uh, how um, families vary and the work, the social work that families do for um, our uh, society. And so um, uh, I, I'm gonna ask a series of questions about where different family forms came from, uh, how different family systems throughout history um, interact to create what we understand as the contemporary family. This will be particularly in the United States, but actually it applies well beyond it at this point. Um, and the lessons that I want you to take home is that the family is not a rigid, unchanging institution, always and everywhere the same. If you read religious texts, for example, one of the things that you will note within those texts is the very different family forms that existed in those texts as opposed to the family forms that we have today. So if you read, for example, the Hebrew Bible or the Tanakh, um, or if you read the Christian Bible, um, the New Testament, you'll see that family structures are very different than the family structures that we have. And so think of family as a social institution that varies over time and place and that serves to construct our understandings of ourselves and the societies that we're in. Um, this means that families as social institutions are constantly interpreted through the lens of lived experience, and like all social institutions, marked by a series of power dynamics or power relationships within the society. So what makes a family? Understandings of family depend upon context, um, geography, where people are, history, and culture. And so the definitions of family depend on when and where you're defining it. Lots of traditions make up families. So some traditions that make up families, for example, are marriages. Marriages are a, a central way in which we define the beginnings, at least, of a family. Um, but so too could adoption um, define a family. So families um, may adopt members into their family, and this can happen either formally or informally. Formally meaning a family could formally and legally adopt someone into their um, household. Or it could happen informally, where a family recognizes that um, 
a certain person is frequently among them, and so they become a, a member of the family. They become quote unquote family. Um, and you know, the uh, um, sometimes families are not constituted um, um, uh, by biological relationships. Um, most obviously in marriage, where marriage typically has some set of prohibitions about having strong biological relationships and being married, although not always. Um, uh, but also there's a, a broader conceptualization of kin or who your kin group is. That are people who are like you um, and people who you think of as having a special set of obligations to obligations that supersede other kinds of obligations that you might have. And so um, what this means is that family helps define a set of social relationships to which you have deep obligations. Um, and uh, those deep obligations elicit often very deep feelings. Sometimes the deep obligations of family can feel like a prison or a trap. Other times they can make us feel far less alone, uh, make us feel connected to others. Now, when you say that understandings of family vary, what we mean is that, you know, what we see today in the modern United States, but also through much of the world, is um, a form of family partnerships that involve the connections of two individuals and then others who are somehow tied to them. Um, so typically children and perhaps parents. But this is um, not what most families have been through most of history. So polygamy has been the most common form of marriage found historically and in the world today but not in the contemporary United States. Um, and so if you look world historically, um, polygamy is, is by far the most common form of marriage. And yet in contemporary societies, it's relatively um, rare um, or comparatively less common. And so this shows us how um, uh, uh, definitions of marriage and family change over time and how they um, uh, vary based upon geography, history, and culture. Um, uh, this idea that um, uh, we now have of the contemporary family as being the always um, uh, 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 enduring form is referred to by scholars as the nostalgia trap. And the nostalgia trap is the idea that, you know, that the traditional family of two parents, two children, and a dog, um, or, you know, uh, um, uh, is in fact traditional. And um, what the scholar Stephanie Kuntz shows um, uh, is that actually contrary to popular belief, this, this quote unquote traditional family was never a reality um, or rarely a reality. So it was not really a reality in the 1950s and it was um, uh, uh, not really the traditional family structure of um, uh, most of American um, society or history. So what we associate with the traditional families emerges at a particular time and place, the 1950s and among white Americans. Um, but the family has never been a monolith like that vision of here, Leave It to Beaver suggests. And Leave It to Beaver, I suspect many of you have never heard of it or know of it, but it was a classic American um, television show from the 1950s that showed the ideal family. And the ideal family was a husband uh, who worked and came home to his wife, who um, was a stay-at-home mother and tended to her two children and their two children, and they would sit and eat dinner together, and the parents had a loving relationship, and the children were primarily tended to by their mother, whose job it was to raise them, and the father's job was to bring back money, and they lived a very sort of comfortable middle-class life. 
And this was a form of projection, um, a, a projection of what families should be. And today we often look back on that and think that that's what families were. But the title of Stephanie Kuntz's book that evaluates and, and looks at the history of the American family is, the title of the book is The Way We Never Were. And what Kuntz notes is that for most families, this is not what life looked like. Um, that, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, women, uh, particularly women of color, often had to work outside of the home. Um, uh, that men were not always present within the family. Um, and uh, that family relationships were often much more complex than this. And that the web of special relationships that people had of um, dependency and obligation typically went far beyond this um, idealized traditional family unit. And so um, Kuntz refers to this as a nostalgia trap. What it highlights to us is how the traditional family is primarily a myth. This is not to say that, you know, I'm not arguing here that it's not a desirable thing or that it is a desirable thing. I'm just pointing out how this traditional form is far from traditional. Um, if you read uh, religious texts, you'll see that polygamous relationships were, in fact, the traditional form at those moments and that this changed over time. The grip on nostalgia as a means to solve our problems can entrench those problems even further, in part because the goals that we have aren't reality-based. Or thought of differently, um, sometimes we think that in order to solve some of the problems of contemporary life, what we need to do is go back to the traditional uh, uh, family. But what Kunz is helping point out here is that what she's noting to us is that like if that thing never existed really in the first place for most people, going back to it is a really naive um, uh, position. Um, and so we might want to give up on this idea, this nostalgic idea of the way that we never were, instead critically evaluate what it was that that family did and why it was that many people never actually lived within that family form. If we critically evaluate the Leave it to Beaver family, this family that's pictured before you here, one of the things that we might think about are what were the gender relations where um, the father worked and the mother stayed at home? And what were the consequences of that? Um, uh, what did it mean that uh, families were structured in that way? And what does a nostalgia of returning to that structure produce for future generation relations in our society? Now, part of this nostalgia is um, because of a great anxiety that we frequently have of the loss of the family or the family in decline. So critics of the contemporary family like to talk about family decline. And um, that what they typically point to when thinking of family decline is uh, the growth in single parent households. So, you know, um, uh, one thing that we might first do when, when exploring this criticism of the decline of the family is to ask, is this the case? So is it the case that, um, uh, that there's been a growth in single parent households? And um, um, this graph actually is not set up particularly well, so I apologize for that um, because it tempor its temporal um, um, structure is not the way it should be. In other words, the most contemporary moment, 2016, is on the far left of the graph, and the oldest time period, 1960, is on the far right, so it's reversed. But you, know, you can still sort of look at this and see that most children still live with two parents. So um, more children are growing up in single parent households than in past decades, but most parents live and have lived with both parents. Um, uh, Kathy Eaton and Nelson's research show that unmarried fathers do want to be part of their children's lives. And that typically there are personal, cultural, or structural issues that impede their ability to do so. I think you might also note that 
there was a rise in one parent households from the 1960s until 2000. But since about 2000, um, the number of uh, one parent households has stayed about the same. So uh, another way of thinking about this is that over the last 20 years, there hasn't really been an increase in single parent households. Um, uh, what there has been is a relative stability. So we might ask what happened between the 1960s and the 2000s to create a rise in single parent households and ask why we think that's a problem in the first place. Now, one of the things that's happened um, with in recent years is that divorces have declined. And so the divorce rate hit a 40 year low in um, 2015. And the divorce rate is highest for the baby boomer generation, the uh, generation born between the mid 40s and into the 60s. And um, the low rate, the rate of 16.9 divorces per 1,000 married women in 2015 is down from a high of 22.6 divorces in 1980. The decline in divorce rates we have seen across all racial groups, across education levels, and across the amount of time. Now, why is it that we saw such high rates of divorce or increased rates of divorce among the baby boom generation? Well, there's a series of reasons. One is the emergence of no-fault divorce, which I'll explain in a little bit. Um, the second is uh, potentially feminist consciousness raising um, uh, among women. And the third is women becoming decreasingly reliant upon their husbands economically. The first reason that a no-fault divorce is a change in laws that says that you can get divorced without identifying your partner as committing some fault. So in some countries, and England actually is a country like this right now, um, uh, uh, one partner has to accuse the other partner of something in order to get divorced. And the things that they can accuse them of are codified in law. So you have to say that, you know, there's been um, uh, um, extreme neglect in the relationship, uh, termination of sex within the relationship, um, some other sets of things that may satisfy the legal requirements of divorce. And if neither party is willing to do that, you can't get divorced, or at least you can't for some period of time. Now, the recently, um, uh, divorce has not been something where you had to go before a court and accuse the other party of something, and a judge would evaluate the uh, accusation at hand, but instead, one could get divorced for no reason. Um, uh, that no one had to be at fault in order for you to get a divorce. This facilitated um, divorces between parties um, for somewhat obvious reasons. Uh, um, the first is that even when people get divorced, um, it can be very challenging to have to accuse one's partner of something, in part because you know, you're embedded in all of these other social relationships. There's friends around, and if one has to say the other was bad, it puts you in a very antagonistic relationship. Similarly, if there are children involved, for one parent to accuse the other parent of something creates a series of challenges. And then the third is that sometimes um, in a divorce, particularly under conditions where one of the parties is not happy about the divorce or one of the parties is maybe particularly controlling, they can contest the fault. They can literally say, no, that is not true. So no-fault divorce is a major um, uh, reason for the rise of the divorce rate after the 1960s. The other is feminist consciousness raising. And feminist consciousness raising was, is important where uh, it began to um, present women with the idea that like they didn't need to be in marriages and that the ideal life for them was not necessarily to be partnered to a man who earned money and to raise children. Um, and that, um, uh, that women had equivalent rights to men. And um, many women experienced in their marriages um, uh, um, uh, domination from their husbands, where the husbands controlled 
wealth, that they controlled their lives, um, in part because of that, um, and uh, that this was a very unpleasant experience, and creating a cultural framework that said, this is not acceptable. In fact, things should be equal, led to, in part, some of, potentially, some of the rise of the divorce rate. And then, perhaps most importantly, women became less economically dependent on their husbands. And this meant two things. Women, um, through the 1970s and into the 80s, entered the labor force at higher rates. And in the labor force, they started to make more money. The gender wage gap declined a little bit. And this economic dependence facilitated women exiting from unions. Um, now, um, this increase in divorce, um, one could read as the decline of the traditional family form. But if you think of the traditional family form as partially a nostalgia trap, um, there are other ways to, to imagine what the rise of divorce meant. The rise of divorce could also be interpreted as an increase in equality, an increase in inequality between um, men and women, and uh, with that increase in inequality between men and women, um, uh, a decline in participating in an institution of gender domination, and fundamentally a transformation of that institution. Perhaps most importantly, though, um, we should recognize that the divorce rate is at a 40-year low. Um, and so some of the concerns about the decline of the family um, you know, may be overblown given the data because of the last two things that I've pointed out to you. The first thing being that um, there has not been a significant increase in single parent households um, in uh, the United States. Uh, and actually single parent households have been roughly flat for the last 20 years. And there's not been an increase in the divorce rate. Um, divorces are relatively, are on the decline over the last 40 years. And so um, something else has been happening. And if we sort of drop our nostalgia and actually begin to look carefully at data, at information about what's happening within the family, we may come up with a different kind of perspective. Now, what I wanted you to take home from this discussion is that the family is a social construct. It's something that um, uh, is produced by a range of institutions, institutions that support the partnering of people, the raising of children, um, uh, et cetera, and that that institution has changed over time. That when you envision the family, you shouldn't fall into the nostalgia trap of a traditional family, in part because what we often think of as the traditional family is not the traditional family. And the most common world historical family form is polygamy. Um, and finally, that the decline of the family doesn't have a huge amount of evidence recently. There may have been a decline in the family in the, from the 60s to the 80s and um, um, in the rise of single parent households through, the, through 2000. But since 2000, there's been no rise in single parent households. And since 1980, there's been a decline in the divorce rate. And rather than read those processes, um, single parent households and the divorce rate in strictly negative terms, we should critically evaluate them with data. That is, we should critically evaluate them with the consequences of that. So in some of the subsequent lectures, we'll look into that and we'll see how it is that people partner and why a range of these transformations has happened over the last um, 40 years.